TLO, what's poppin'? We are on Twitch. We are not live. But you can leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells. Let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK. If we ever are live and you miss a live, right here is where all the highlights and things of that nature will be. Uh, link to this is in the description. Also, the link to the Patreon is in the description. This is what makes the channel be able to be the channel. Pays all the bills. <laughs> uh, don't forget we got the Discord as well, man. This is where we get a lot of our requests. And one of those requests were Crime Watch Live. Series 17, episode 15. Friday the 24th of March. Last, okay, let's get into it. And welcome to Friday's program and the last of this current series. We're coming to you live from our studios in the heart of Cardiff. Today, it's the very sad murder of Jennifer Kiley, whose body was found in a seafront shelter in Eastbourne. We have now got new DNA at the scene, which is very significant for this investigation. But we need to find the person whose DNA that is. It's been 18 years since she was killed. Can you help solve this case? Welcome to Crime Watch Live. Borida. Before we start with today's programme, we wanted to bring you an update on an appeal we covered earlier this series about the sexual assaults on teenagers in Harpenden and Hertfordshire. Well, over these last 48 hours, police have charged a man with a number of offences in connection to this case, and we'll bring you more news on that when we can. Coming up this morning, we'll be hearing how a covert operation in Bristol was used to identify a man sexually assaulting lone women. The victims, when they came to us, were extremely traumatised. And if we didn't act quickly, I was absolutely certain we would have had a more serious offence occur in that area. We'll be hearing about the Thames Valley Police Operation Police. program. Then please call 899 charged. It's an appeal police have run with us before. It's the killing of mother of three, Jennifer Kiley, whose murder remains unsolved. Can you help? For more than 18 years, Margaret Kiley has been grieving for her daughter. I raised a perfect child. You know, she was sweet, loving, giving, ambitious. She was a nice girl, very nice girl, very pretty. In 2005, 35-year-old Jennifer Kiley was murdered. She was a very good kid. That's why it's so hard to take this in, that she's no longer with us. You know, that's the hard part. Her killer has never been found. Yeah, that's the toughest part, man. R.I.P. to her, like, them unsolved murders with no closure for the family members. Tough. Jennifer's murder shocked the town of Eastbourne in East Sussex where she lived and was the subject of a major police investigation. But after two years, with no viable leads, the investigation was put on hold. However, since 2017, the police have been actively pursuing new lines of inquiry. Detective Superintendent Emma Heater now leads the investigation. Old homicides that aren't solved and never filed. We assess them every couple of years to see if there are any new techniques, uh, new technology, new forensic methods that we... I was just about to ask that. Like, how do they file these things? And how do they, like, do... Because from 2005 to 2023, a lot of different technology, a lot of options have been, a lot of new things have been discovered on how to solve crime. But my thing is, any DNA evidence or anything that you may have had available to you the, the days of 
around the crime are gone now, right? Unless you, like, preserve them cryogenically or something. We can apply to old cases to try and progress them. In early 2005, Jennifer was living a transient life on the streets of Eastbourne. It hadn't always been like this. A few years before, Jennifer had been living in a house in London with her partner and three children. She was just a normal mother, you know. She just, she loved to play with her children. She would sit down on the floor and play with them. She was a good mum. She just loved her kids. But shortly after the birth of her third child, her mental health suffered and she struggled to cope. I think she was on the verge of a nervous breakdown. And we tried to help her, but Jennifer was too proud. Y'all think she had postpartum? He said after the third pregnancy, you know, having kids, like, you know, you can go through stuff mentally, like, po you know, postpartum. And with every child is different. She was too proud. By now, she had become a well-known character in Eastbourne, pushing her belongings around in an old buggy, wearing a distinctive long grey coat and sleeping where she could. She did seek support from charities such as the Salvation Army, so people would have known her from charitable organisations such as that. Detectives were able to piece together Friday, January 21st, 2005, Eastbourne, Texas. I mean, I said Texas, East Sussex. Detectives were able to piece together her last known movements on the evening of the 21st of January, 2005. Jennifer had spent the day with friends at an address in Upton Gardens. She'd come and gone from the address during the day. After having a bath at her friend's house, Jennifer left the address at around midnight Doing? and headed back I'm done. onto the streets. At one o'clock in the morning, she is seen by a friend who knew her and recognised her. Hello, Jenny. She was seen to be heading westerly along Eastbourne Seafront in the direction of Holywell. During the night, Jennifer had made her way down to the lower tier of the promenade near Holywell, finding refuge in a seafront shelter. Eastbourne from during the daytime, it's very busy. Lots of families walk here, dog walkers, runners. But at night, it's very different. It's very secluded, it's unlit. At five in the morning, Jennifer's body was discovered by cleaners in the furthest shelter along the seafront towards Beachy Head. So this is the beach shelter where Jennifer was found. The beach shelter has been partially reconstructed, so it's not exactly how it would have been in 2005. But when Jennifer was found by the cleaner, she was completely inside the shelter where you see the benches now. Jennifer was found with multiple stab wounds. Her belongings were all piled on top of her and she had been set alight. God damn. Somebody did Jennifer like that? That sound personal. I don't know how anybody could have done that. It's incomprehensible. She was no threat, but he took her life from her. And took mine too, to a certain extent. Despite a major police investigation and a nationwide appeal on Crime Watch. Well, please don't let Jennifer's killer get away with it. Three children have lost their mother. Police were not able to find her killer. The biggest challenge this investigation was probably Jennifer's lifestyle. 
There wasn't an address for us to go and search. She didn't use mobile phones. There wasn't a financial footpath. It was difficult to track down people that may have had contact with Jennifer. Yeah. She was living like a, you know, she was living a homeless type lifestyle. Who's, who's with no connection. She was, she was, she was, what's that word? She was off the grid. There's no way you can even de develop like a trace of what happened. We didn't know if this is somebody who knew Jennifer or whether it was a stranger. This was a very, very complicated case to try and solve. The investigation was reopened in 2011 and then again in 2017 when developments in forensics gave detectives a new line of inquiry. We have now got new DNA at the scene which is very significant for this investigation. But we need to find the person whose DNA that is. We read DNA at the scene. We need the public to come forward well, and help us on this. Or, or how many? January saw yet another anniversary of Jennifer's murder. It is the 18th her mother Margaret has endured. I think about her every day, but on her anniversary, I can't stop, I can't switch her off. You know, I get mad. Somebody somewhere knows who it is and what he's done. Just please come forward and let us know. Jennifer's murder really is incredibly sad and detectives have not given up the search to find the person responsible. Jennifer was last seen on Friday the 21st of January 2005. And it's so it's like a bunch of quick hitting documentaries, this Crime Watch. I've never seen Crime Watch in my life. Spent the day with friends in Upperton Gardens, leaving around midnight. She was seen on CCTV at the Kentucky Fried Chicken Shop on Langley Road. And then again at around 1am near Eastbourne Pier, she was spotted again by a friend walking along the promenade in the direction of Hollywell. Just a few hours later, a member of the public discovered Jennifer's body in the shelter on the lower tier of the promenade. Now, there is one man who was seen by witnesses and was captured on CCTV the night of January the 21st, 2005, who police are still looking to trace. Now, he was described as having an Eastern European accent, around five foot 10 tall and slim to medium build. His hair was short and light blonde. He had a roundish face, dominant cheek and jawlines, and what was described as a very straight nose. Are they gonna show like a drawing of him? He was wearing a dark blue short jacket with a collar zipped right up to his chin, a pair of gray jeans and white training shoes. The police have the DNA of their suspect. They now just need a match. If anyone for any reason hasn't yet come forward but does have details about this case, police are... You said white training shoes, that don't add up then. That ain't him. They said they, she stabbed somebody to death. It, it would be like blood all over. Urging you to please come forward. Now remember that DNA can be used to eliminate people from this investigation as well as match the person responsible. You can contact us on 08000 468 999 until midday and that is, remember, a free word crime, leave a space. Later, we'll be joined by the free for NHF. Other people. Time to bring you a couple of other appeals now. First, West Midlands Police want to speak with these two individuals in connection with a stabbing in Birmingham city centre. On the 15th of June, 2022, two men inside a silver VW Touareg car approached a 19-year-old man on Staniforth Street in Birmingham. Following an argument, the two men got out of the car and stabbed the victim a number of times. Now, thankfully, his injuries were not ultimately life-threatening. The first individual on the right is described as being a mixed-race male of average build with light brown hair and clean shaven. The second individual on the left is described as tall, slim, Asian male with a beard. Now, if you think you can identify these two men, please do get in touch. Also, British Transport Police want to identify... What am I watching? Crime Watch? Do, don't we got one of these in America as well? Wasn't T.I. on, did a, did a commercial about Crime Watch? Was that, 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 was that this? 
identify five men in connection with a serious public order. So this is just a show basically telling people to like, telling the public to, if you've seen something, say something. Order offense at Preston train station last summer. On Saturday, the 6th of August, 2022, at approximately 7 p.m., a number of people were verbally abused, punched, kicked and knocked to the floor following a clash between supporters of Luton Town Football Club and supporters of Hull City Football Club. Now, a large number of people were involved in this incident and numerous identifications have been made, but police still want to ID these five males, all believed to be Hull City supporters who they think may be able to assist with their investigations. So, if you recognise them, please do get in touch. Now, tomorrow marks 21 years since Edward Donnelly disappeared. Please do grass. Appeared <laughs> from his home in Sacriston, County Durham. Police believe he was murdered. I'm joined now by Detective Superintendent Lee Gosling. Lee, thanks so much for coming on the programme today. Um, can you just start by telling us a bit about Edward? What, what was he like as a person? Yep, yeah, so Edward was 53 when he went missing from Sacriston, uh, a local miner in the colliery. Report missing by his sister on March the 25th, 2002. Despite numerous inquiries and searches and over 300 people spoken to, uh, he essentially vanished without a trace. Uh, on that basis, a murder investigation was launched. And we still think it was a murder today. And he was a quiet and unassuming man, wasn't he? You're really trying to understand what happened. He was, he was. Um, and that in itself is one of the reasons why we really need to find out what happened because of the fact he was quiet and unassuming. Absolutely. Well, let's go through some details because we've got a still that was taken from some CCTV. This is from the day he disappeared. So this is the, the Edward on the morning that he disappeared. Just talk us through what, what we can see here. Yeah, certainly. So we know that Edward visited Lloyd's Bank in Sacriston between 10 and 10.30 a.m. Uh, on the day he disappeared, withdrew. Are all of the cases that come on this show like cold cases that have, that are like, that can't be solved or, or, or the cops are having a hard time solving? Or like have no clue at all was... 160 no pounds in nothing? cash. And we know that that took place about three hours before his last ever sighting. Now you've pieced together what you can of his final movements. In fact, we've, we've got a map that just helps to illustrate it in a bit more detail. So let's, let's talk through this. What have we got here, Lee? Yeah, so we can see the, uh, the bank visit there uh, on the left-hand side. And then the, the very last sighting uh, was on Plosworth Road, just inside the Red Lion pub at about 13.45 hours, uh, or, or just before. And we're really keen to understand what happened uh, after that sighting. And you can imagine their family even more so. Yeah, absolutely. They're just looking for answers, aren't they? It's, it's yeah. been a long time without them. Um, can you just give us a bit more of a, a detailed description of Edward? Yep, certainly. So uh, Edward was five foot eight in height, uh, mostly brown hair, pale skin, known locally as Eddie, uh, lived with his sister, uh, minor, as I say, mm. quiet and unassuming, as you mm. said earlier. There are some unusual elements to this case. I feel like Eddie just skipped town. He ain't want to deal with it no more. He just got up out of there. He was like, all right, I've had enough. So aren't they? Let me withdraw this 160. Let me get to where I'm going and I'll figure it out there. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, so sometime uh, between the visit to the bank to draw out the 160 pounds and being reported missing, the money, the bank book, and his house keys ended up back in his home address. Mm. And we're really keen to understand how that happened and what allowed that to happen. Oh, so he didn't take the money. Okay, okay. Yeah, of course, it's trying to put all these pieces t together to build up the complete picture. Indeed. There were extensive searches conducted at the time. What did you glean from them? Yeah, so over 300 people were spoken to as part of the inquiry. We, uh, we scoured the local countryside, uh, mine shafts, forests, no sign of Edward, sadly, whatsoever. Uh, and ever since then, we've been convinced that it was a it was a murder. And as you said, it's been 20, well, 21 years tomorrow since Edward disappeared. How can the viewers that are watching this morning at home help? So, Sacristan. Honestly, this is my thought process on these, these officers that's coming on here. T 21 years, this one. The last one was 20, how long? 2015, 18 years. If y'all couldn't figure it out in in the first two out two years, what we'll make y'all think we got something to say about it? 
I think that what they're trying to do is trying to get somebody to come through with a guilty conscience that knows something. Which is, you know, they got to try, they got to exhaust every single avenue. I'm pretty sure, like, it has worked before, but this is my first time watching, so I'm just, you know. It's a very small, uh, closely knit uh, mining community. Uh, people are born there, live there, work there. We're convinced somebody in that village knows what's happened. Allegiance has changed. There's been a bit of time passed. We really hope somebody will come forward and shed some light on everything we've talked about just so we can give the family the closure that they deserve. Yeah, they need some closure. And sadly, Edward's sister passed away without knowing what happened to him. So as you say, uh, the family really needs some justice and some answers. Lee, thank you so much. Uh, as we said, 21 years since uh, Edward's disappearance. Do you have any details that could help solve this case? If you do, please get in touch with us using the details below. I'm almost sure, like what, what age audience watches Crime Watch? Because I'm almost, you said 21 years ago, there's people that weren't even born when that happened that you're trying to appeal to. Which, like I said, you know, let leave no stone unturned, but, you know. In 2022, female joggers were being approached and assaulted by an unknown man in Bristol. But police set up a covert operation to find and stop him. In March 2022, police in Bristol began receiving reports of a series of sexual assaults, all in the early hours of the morning and all in the Bishopsworth area. We had four reports of different women, uh, all on their own. Um, some of them had headphones in, so they didn't see the perpetrator coming up behind them. The victims, when they came to us, were extremely traumatised, um, you know, really distraught, really upset about what had happened. This was a stranger attack, really, really frightening. When the victims all gave similar descriptions of their attacker, police suspected they were dealing with a serial offender. It seemed to be escalating, and if we didn't act quickly, I was absolutely certain we would have had a more serious offence occur in that area. Police began trawling through CCTV, taken in... Yeah, that was my next question. Like, how deep is the... You know, slobbered. How deep is the assault? Like, what, kind, what, what was done? The areas where the attacks took place, and they found this. He suddenly starts following our victim. He sees her, he follows her, as she runs up the hill, he puts a face mask on and then runs off after her. And then it goes, he runs up the hill following Arvik. Found this. He suddenly starts following our victim. He sees <laughs> premeditated pervertism. Pervertism. Like, what is, what is? He sees her, he follows her as she runs up the hill. People he puts a weird. face mask on and then runs off after her. And then it goes off on camera. That was it, uh, enough to give us a clearer description of actually who this person was, what he looked like, how he ran, how he behaved. Detectives had seen enough and decided to try and catch the attacker red-handed. Due to the escalating behavior, we took the decision to uh, put out an operation and put people out in plain clothes in that area that night the team focused their efforts on a bus stop and junction where the man had been seen regularly. That particular evening, the team consisted of approximately eight people. They went out as it got dark and carried out the, the covert tactics in around waiting, watching. After a few hours, officers spotted a man loitering around the bus stop. I just fell right into the trap. Stop. Good. Very few buses go through there at that time in the morning. And from the images from the CCTV and the way he walked, they became suspicious of this male. So the decision was made, one of the officers would approach this male um, and the male actually started talking to the officer, uh, asking them for a lighter. And as they talked to him, his story didn't quite add up of why he was there and, and, and uh, what he was doing. And, you know, the officer's opinion and suspicion was, was raised that actually we think that's him. 
that's when we decided that we would arrest him. Caught you red-handed. Well, not red-handed, but you know what I'm saying, on suspicion. Put that face right on the gate. 27-year-old Craig Pearsall lived locally and had no criminal history. He looked like a prevert. He refused to talk, so officers began searching through his mobile phone and computers. On them, they found evidence of more crimes. We were able to identify that actually he'd filmed numerous victims on his mobile phone, clearly following further people other than the known victims we had. So we started to try and piece together his behaviour, his offending, and try and identify further victims. Police also found evidence Pearsall had been secretly filming up women's skirts. Oh, and detectives were able to identify and inform one of his victims. How was they able to do that? What kind of detective work was they doing? How, how did they do that? And detectives were able to identify and inform one of his victims. The victim had been filmed by Craig Pearsall from behind um, where he'd filmed uh, under her skirt um, and had then continued to follow her. So we were able to identify the locations um, and managed to identify her home address and that's when we went. Oh, okay, so y'all identified her location. I'm looking like, how, wait, how did y'all identify for her? And, and spoke to her uh, and identified and informed her that she'd been a victim of upskirting. She was absolutely mortified by that. Uh, had no idea that she'd been a victim of crime, uh, had never seen Craig Pearsall before. I'm going to be honest with y'all. I ain't never in my entire life, like I'm talking whole life, heard nobody get, <laughs> get convicted of that crime. Like this is like, I thought that was like a, I don't know what I thought, but like I, I didn't, I didn't know. Uh, and was extremely shocked by what we were telling her. I'm shocked that dude was doing this. A trawl of Pearsall's computer also revealed evidence that he'd been trying to obtain indecent images of children. Oh my God. This painted a horrible picture of an individual that was a predator towards women and lone females, but also showed this hidden um, predatory behavior towards children. Pearsall was sentenced to three years and ten months in prison and was That's it? added to the sex offenders register for life. Craig Pearsall was, in my opinion, a, a dangerous individual. He is a predator, a danger to, to women. When I leave the house, I find that I am anxious. I still find the sound of running footsteps behind me extremely frightening. Ever since that day, I feel like my entire life has plummeted. It's hard to put into words the way he has affected me and my life. I can no longer walk down the road on my own, even if this is in the middle of the day, without this crushing feeling of fear. PTSD. Without the, the victims uh, coming forward, being brave, uh, and reporting these incidents to the, to the police, um, Craig Pearsall would still be out in the community, and I have no doubt that he would be continue to offend such fast work there to find their suspect now earlier yeah that was good police work they got on it immediately we spoke to the frontline singers a vocal group made up of police officers paramedics nurses and other key workers who came together during the pandemic we asked the founders james beanie and gina giorgio what motivated them to start this up in the first place Okay, here's, here's where the comedy comes in. All right. James and I are musical theatre composers and producers, and in the lockdown we saw what everybody was going through, so we wanted to use music to share a positive message. And James, I know that the group is, is pretty large, uh, but you've got some of them here. Who, who have you got with us today? Uh, yeah, we have a, a bit of a mixture, nurses, mm -hmm. doctors. Uh, we have a midwife here today, people from the police, teachers. I like how they made them wear their uniforms to make it, you know what I'm saying? Teachers. Uh, we also inclu include members, uh, there were actually some actors in the group who 
during the pandemic took on frontline or key worker roles. Yeah, so Such everyone variety. here was working on that frontline in some way, shape or form during the pandemic. Yeah. yeah. And Gina, you've even got your dad. That's salutable. Dad Demi, PCSO yeah. Demi. Hello. 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 Hi Demi, how are you doing? <laughs> so, so why did you get involved in the group then? It's my daughter, how could I say no? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, when, when they told me about the project and the people that were going to be involved, um, when I met them, I, I couldn't say no. It felt like a family instantly. And it became almost like um, an escape. It was like therapy. Mm. And it's been a joy ever since. <laughs> so lovely. And Jean Are they going to sing for us? What a pleasant surprise. You, know, you, you said you met during, uh, in, in lockdown, this all started, and you met sort of virtually at the time. Uh, but in person, is the first time you actually met when you went on Britain's Got Talent and did very, yeah. very well, may Thank I add. Thank you. Thank you. It was all the way on Britain's Got Talent, so this is not something that I can make fun of. This is like, they're going to be good. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So because our group is from all over the UK, it was actually really difficult to get everybody in the room together at the same time. So we'd been rehearsing in sort of smaller groups, and the first time that we all got together was the audition for Britain's Got Talent. Wow. You know, it's so great to hear that you've got this sense of community Unity now you're all friends you know you're in it together and you also raise money for a range of charities don't you James that's right so the the original Stranger World video that we released during the lockdown was for NHS charities together and then after the fact that they just went from <laughs> my bad the fact that they just went from somebody being convicted of upskirting to this is wild to BGT we sort of properly recorded the uh, the single strange old world at Abbey Road Studios which was an amazing wow. experience wow, Abbey Road Studios that's where Jordan that's where Jordan did his last uh, project obviously for his first project for, for the group and uh, yeah that that was released for frontline 19 which is a, a charity that offers psychological support to people on the front line who have obviously suffered such a, a or gone through such a difficult period during the mm -hmm. pandemic yeah. And Gina, tell us the importance then of what you are going to sing for us today. So the song is called Strange Old World and it is exactly... We get a damn song and I, I'm going to have to mute it. Y'all know how it goes. ...about that, how strange the world is and the unexpected things that it throws our way. But it's about standing together as a community to get through it. Oh, well, thank you so much to all of you for coming today. We're really looking forward to hearing the song at the end of the programme. Uh, oh, we're going to wrap it up with that song. Okay. Now, this series, we've heard remarkable stories of those involved on the front line and the legal system. And now it's time to hear both the physical and emotional journey of Adaronke Apata. My name is Adaronke Apata. When I was growing up in Nigeria, I went into the University of Lagos, the best in the country. I was looking forward to becoming a microbiologist. But there was a part of me that was hidden. I got discovered to be having a relationship with a same-sex person like myself. So you're a community member. I Nothing wrong with that. Salute to the community. And I was taken to a Sharia court. And if the judgment was passed, Wait, what? I was a sex person like myself. Wait, 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 wait. Uh, there was a part of me that was hidden in Lagos, the best in the country. I was looking forward to becoming a microbiologist. So in Lagos, you were in school to become a microbiology, but you got caught for having, you know, same sex relations and things of that nature and they took you to wait what? Uh, there was a part of it and i was taken to a sharia court and if the judgment was passed i was going to be sentenced to death Damn. so i had to suddenly flee nigeria for for my safety that's why i ended up in the U. okay nigeria they don't play about that okay I was but the but the but the penalty like the the, the punishment was death. Then dispersed to Manchester. I started sleeping rough. And sleeping rough for me was it wasn't an experience that any human being should have really, because to the extent that I would sleep at people's uh, backyards, sheds, even bus stops. 
and begging for food. It is against the law to work if you're still seeking asylum. And when I worked, I got caught working and I got sent to prison for that. I am sorry for that I broke the law at the time, but I was so desperate I needed to feed myself. That was when I was facing deportation. You definitely couldn't get deported. You was, that's like, deportation for you is life and death. I couldn't afford to pay for a solicitor, and so I had to start researching. And whilst I was in detention center, a lot of people told me then that I should go and read law. It took me 13 years to get granted refugee status. But when I was told, I was relieved. I just started crying. As you should. It didn't really sink that I could become a barrister one day. When I was called to the bar, that was one of the... When I was called barrister, it didn't really sink that I could become a barrister. I never knew that was what y'all called like judges out there. Like, cause when initially when she said it, until I seen the headpiece, until she said that, I thought she was talking about a Starbucks employee making coffee. I'm not even lying to you. I'm like, barista, what? One day, when I was called to the bar, that was one of the most memorable days of my life. I'm trying to help other people in the same situation that I was in who are fleeing persecution also. So I'm from the charity called African Rainbow Family. We have five centers in the UK. We have over or nearly 900 people that we support every year. My hope is that those that have been granted their stay would continue to help the other people coming so that they also can get the freedom that they deserve. We need safety and sanctuary for people who have been persecuted back in their countries in the UK. African Rainbow Family has actually helped so many people to secure refugee status in the UK. I feel it's important for me really to share the knowledge that I have in helping other people to be able to be safe and just so that other people will not find themselves in the same way that I was because being homeless, being... I mean, anyway, that's the goal, man. Help other people, you know. You, 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 you ran so other people can walk. You got thrown on that fire so other people can, you know, stay heat resistant. You sank so that other people can float. That's the one. That's the best one. Cared of the future. It's not. It's it's not something that I want any other person to go through. Now it's time for the last of this series, Wanted Faces. First, do you recognise this man? He's called Ron Domi, although he also uses the name Alex Brussels. He looked guilty, whatever he is, whoever he is. Officers in Bedfordshire want to speak to him in connection with a serious offence. He's of slim build, has blue eyes and shaved dark. Slim build, Those, them is green eyes. It's, it's speak to him in connection with a serious offence. He's of slim build, has blue eyes. Nah, bro. In the comments, is that green or blue? Am I, am I, is something wrong with me? He's in shaved dark hair. He speaks with an Albanian accent and has links to Luton in Bedfordshire. The elbows. Edmonton, Ealing and Acton in London. Next, Adam Lloyd. He's known to have used a number of other names, including Fatima, James, Perry and Lee, and the surnames Haynes, Lloyd and Slender. He's been recalled to prison, but has disappeared. The 27-year-old is slim build, with dark blonde hair and a small one centimetre scar under his left eye. Also has a large tattoo of a rose on his chest and a crown on his wrist. 
Or have a look at this man, Orgest Jebeju. Officers in South Yorkshire believe he may have vital information about a murder. The 39-year-old has a receding hairline and wears a close-shaved beard. <laughs> I know they just didn't use a descriptive <laughs> to describe a man as with a that's vital information about a murder. The 39 year old has a receding hairline and wears. <laughs> that's that's emotional distressment. He has a close shaved beard, originally from Albania, but also speaks Italian. He has connections across England, including the whole of Yorkshire, Humberside, Bedfordshire, Leicestershire, and also Essex. And finally for the run, have you seen Steve Shannon? Officers in Merseyside want to speak with him about some firearm-related offences. The 28-year-olds have slim build with dark curly brown hair and brown eyes. All the faces from this series are on our website, and if you have any information, do get in touch. Our final film this series is the incredible police work that went into identifying and catching a gang of some of the country's most ruthless thieves. Every single one of us in that investigation knew that these were very, very dangerous people. That they were cynically committing crime in our communities. Oh, is this like the ATM robberies? And they had to be stopped. Thames Valley is home to some of the most picturesque towns and villages yeah, the UK be beautiful. Look at this. Is in England. But in 2019, the, air Look at the area was thrown into turmoil as a spate of ATM attacks took place. We were dealing with uh, some sophisticated criminals who were using techniques and tactics which uh, are generally... Are these the Aldi boys? ...really used by organised crime groups. The gang blew apart ATMs with explosive gases to get to the cash. Generally, these offences can be completed within three or four minutes by skilled criminals. The ATMs that were attacked were uh, in small convenience stores, sometimes in residential areas. One victim, she grabbed her infant child and ran from her home, thinking that uh, something significant like a bomb or a gas explosion had taken place. You can't understate the risk to the community and the public when you're, you're talking about igniting flammable gases with petrol. Extremely reckless and very dangerous. They would also use stolen 4x4s ram them into shops and drag out the cash machines with huge lorry straps. But one attack in Bletchingdon didn't go according to plan. Traffic officer responding to that alarm call and call from members of the public got sight of the vehicle that was in possession of the ATM, pursued it. He lost sight of it for a short period of time, but then was able to uh, locate the vehicle abandoned in a service road close to a caravan park. And within that, he found the ATM intact. Crucially, also in the vehicle was uh, a balaclava. Forensic work meant that that balaclava could be linked to the key offender in that organised crime group. Uh, and that was really strong evidence for us. Jimmy Sheen is a career criminal. And we're talking about an individual that previously uh, served a prison sentence for discharging a firearm in a public place and injuring people. He uh, has absolutely no compunction in committing any sort of crime. Uh, hey Siri. Uh huh. What does compunction mean? Absolutely. A feeling of guilt, moral scruple. Oh, a feeling of guilt or moral scruple, scruple that prevents or fi why wouldn't you just okay? I guess that's W vocabulary for this gentleman. No cap. Uh, it's quite intimidating and threatening to people that get in his way. Sheen is not someone that you would want to cross. Police intel began to link the ATM attacks to this one group. And with the heat on, they switch to another type of crime, stealing high-value agricultural and plant vehicles. Fundamentally a very expensive... Those things are expensive. 
expensive one on my area, a place called Cassington, where they stole uh, £400,000 worth of brand new tractors. Quite an audacious theft, where they drove all six of them out of the location in one night. That's crazy, though. I ain't never seen nothing like that. This is the first time I ever heard of a crime like this. Only in the UK is they stealing tractors. <laughs> uh, all right. With evidence of offences piling up against them, the police needed to disrupt the gang's activity. So they recalled Jimmy Sheen to prison for owning a vehicle, which was a breach of his parole. But that still left the other members of the group who were perfectly capable of continuing and committing serious acquisitive crime on their own, and they chose to do so. Intelligence led the police to a stolen black Mercedes at a caravan park near Kidlington. So on the 10th of June 2020, a drone team was sent in to investigate. What they showed me was quite remarkable. Not only had they located the vehicle, but the activity around it over a period of sort of 10 minutes showed me men in black beanie hats, balaclavas, heavy jackets and gloves. They'd captured what was quite clearly the group preparing to go out and commit another serious offence. So for me then the pressure was on because we didn't know where they were going and we had no control of that vehicle. At, one, at some point you got to be like, okay, we got enough. You know what I'm saying? Because the life of crime is going to, the life of crime normally gets extended because of greed. You get what I'm saying? Especially robbers and whatnot. Like, they, enough is never enough. You get what I'm saying? So they just like continue and continue to, and sometimes they just addicted to the rush of it. That's why they can't really stop. So, greed is going to get you popped. You doing these type of crimes, you gotta know you they're 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 looking for you. I then get another uh, urgent phone call, and I'm told that that vehicle has uh, been on the wrong side of the road, on a blind bend, has been involved in a very serious uh, road traffic collision. A key piece of evidence in the form of a mobile phone was thrown from the vehicle by uh, the driver, despite his injuries. But thankfully, a sharp-eyed firefighter spotted that and that became a real key piece of evidence. One of the men in the criminal's car died. Okay. Following on from the crash, gang member Jimmy Loveridge was arrested and charged for death by dangerous driving and sent to prison. The police launched Operation Jackknife to bring the rest of the organized crime group to justice. Detectives conducted a search with our forensic teams of the Mercedes and what was recovered from them was pretty startling. So in there we had uh, balaclavas, we had chains, we had a large machete. Clearly equipped and ready to commit a serious crime, willing to use violence. The fact that we knew this vehicle had been on this uh, particular site and there was likely to be uh, some key evidence that we needed to recover as soon as possible. So we were able then to obtain uh, two search warrants on a caravan site near Killington. They discovered £18,500 in cash, homemade balaclavas and stolen vehicles. But it was at the back of the site that yielded crucial evidence for the... I feel like these are like a part of the group, the Audi boys. I know that was in Germany, but didn't it like branch off to the UK as well? The police gas cylinders. Along with that were things like uh, disc cutters and other stolen tools, which we also knew were hallmarks of the earlier ATM offending. We recovered critical uh, evidence in the form of a number of mobile phones. Detective Inspector Lorna Briggs led the team analysing the phone data. So we're looking at lots of different things in terms of the phones, photos taken from them to try and identify who they belong to, uh, contacts in there, voicemails, any messages that have been sent, phone calls, but also so when the phone's off, that can tell us quite a lot. Can we match that up to offending? When does it come back on again? Is that after the offending? And that very much formed the focus of this investigation in relation to phone work. So what we had to do is turn that intelligence into evidence. The phone that was recovered from the crash belonged to Jimmy Loveridge. On it was a video of him showcasing the six stolen tractors. They're all identical, same machines. 
all 2020 brand new. There's also suggestion on the videos that they are actually um, stealing to order. Man dying for one, it's a bailer, a hey, bailer. Obviously when you're out getting the machines, there was one on there, just take it, innit? It's a lot of hay baler. I think I know one of them is, I know a couple of them is, I've seen them on the farms. Quite shocking and quite brazen, hence the reason why Jimmy Loveridge was keen to get rid of that phone from the vehicle. While the phones were being analysed, the police found searches and messages between Jimmy Sheen and his partner about valuable trophies at the Newmarket Racecourse Museum. Ring me, we need to go and pick the motor up for this other thing. He's got one already, so we need to shoot up and get it straight away. Our gang, on a whim, in between doing ATM thefts and high-value agricultural vehicles, had driven to Newmarket one night, broken into that Newmarket Racecourse Museum and stolen trophies to the value of £380,000. During their audacious crime sprees, this gang stole over £1 million worth of agricultural machinery and caused close to £1 million worth of damage in the ATM attacks. In April 2021, six men, Shane Harris, Paul Smith, Jimmy Loveridge, Jimmy Sheen, David Riley and Frenny Green were arrested and charged with multiple offences. I think probably one of the highlights of the investigation for the investigating DCs is, is doing the interviews and putting all the offending to them. When we went to prison, particularly to arrest Jimmy Sheen, um, we stood for quite some time going through the list of offences that he was being arrested for, and you can, you can see the shock on his face. Quite a satisfying moment for the team. There were over a million pages of uh, evidence, documents and material subject to some form of scrutiny in this investigation. So it was, a, it was a huge investigation. The gang were all found guilty and collectively sentenced to a total of 74 years damn. in prison. God damn. What's 74 divided by 6? 100. 100. Yeah, that's what I thought. I'm saying 12. Only, not only, but... You know what I'm saying? On top of every other charge they got. The Operation Jack has become a labour of love for this team. Like this guy, um, with the reckless, dangerous driving. My murder. He ran for two years. I think we all recognise that never again in our careers will we investigate uh, anything which has got this sort of breadth and this uh, level of seriousness. Well, last month, 11 Chief Constable commendations were given to that team for their work bringing down the OCG. Remember, if you're affected by any of the issues in today's program, you can head to bbc.co.uk forward slash action line. I'm not. Are these the singers? Can't even watch it though. But TLO, leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells. Um, I don't know if this is even going to let me go to YouTube, so it might be on Patreon. Who knows? I'm gone.